So as Janet settles down, um, I have a question to ask you. Can you list the restaurants uh, you have at the moment on the books of Gusto? Sure. So we have, I opened it as Cafe Nervosa, but now it's Trattoria Nervosa. Then Gusto 101, King West area. Pie, Northern Thai, Kin, another uh, Royal Thai restaurant. Chubby's Jamaican Kitchen. Uh, Felix in Los Angeles, and we're under construction for five more restaurants. So here's the question for all of you. How many of you have eaten in one of Janet's restaurants? Here's your audience. They wow, know your food. Okay. I can also put my hand up and ask and the MPW co-chair team because we actually managed to get dinner at Ken. So when you have so many restaurants, can I ask the audience, who loves the food at these restaurants and who does? Let, put your hands up if you love it. All right, for those who've been, who don't love it as much. <laughs> I think that's pretty obvious. <laughs> so, would they really put their hands up? Yeah, they, they would. This is like it's a pretty honest crowd. Sisters supporting a sister. Uh, but it's also a pretty honest crowd. So here's the question. You have a loyal fan base in Toronto. You have a loyal fan base in LA now with Felix, where there's a wait list for a while that Patty Sellers did not believe. How is Felix different um, to your entire uh, setup in Toronto? And how do you convince people like Patty that it is an amazing experience? Well, Patty was a little lukewarm and she told me she was going to LA tomorrow. And I said, well, you have to eat at my restaurant, Felix. And she was like, oh yeah, tell me more. Like, how good is it? And I said, ask your friends because it, it's, a, it's a hard restaurant to get into. So when I opened up Felix two years ago, Esquire magazine about three months after we opened said we were the number one new restaurant in all of America. So being a Canadian woman, I, I was just so proud of myself and the team that um, we had such incredible accolades. So it's a tough restaurant to get into. We have a wait list of 300 people a night to get in. So Patty, I got you. Yeah. Getting you in. There you go. So the way your business, uh, you set up your business, the story of it is quite different um, from the way a lot of businesses in, I mean, in the restaurant industry work. Your strategy has been quite different. Um, run us through the start because I, I know I've read about and we talked about it as well that you're, you took the money that your father had set aside for your wedding um, and put it into your first business, Nervosa, um, and then you followed a specific path that is not common in the restaurant industry, which is what? Explain how the success of Gusto happens. Well, I was asked to be a partner at Nervosa, uh, and so it was, I was in partnership with a man who was the chef for four and a half years, and I like to coin that relationship uh, soul-destroying. It was an awful, awful partnership, and after four and a half years of being partners, and I, I used money from um, an investment I made in my 20s by asking my father to give me wedding money. And here, I'm still not married. <laughs> never say never, but um, glad. <laughs> May my, my father's soul rest in peace, but I got, I got the wedding money. That's got a the smart move. Got the ball rolling. Um, and, you know, the happiest day of my life is when I bought this partner out. And I decided at that point I was going to just do it on my own for a while and took on no partners. I didn't, I didn't take on any financing. I just built the company on my own slowly. I thought the smart idea would be to buy real estate. So I saved my money selling margarita pizzas and I bought the corner of Yorkville and Bel Air and I think it's a very important piece of real estate in Toronto. After I purchased that real estate, I felt that I had a very solid foundation and from there, that's when I started to go out and buy other buildings and then put restaurants in these other buildings. So um, I own the majority of the real estate where the restaurants are. It's, and I'm not, I, I'm not gonna be purchasing many more buildings. I don't think it's the way to really grow. I think my foundation is solid and I'll just concentrate now on proliferating with the restaurants. So explain how the strategy is going to change because at the end of the day, this is now becoming a behemoth of, uh, of an empire. Five new restaurants, uh, two in LA, where property prices are interesting, is a polite way I can say it. Um, 
uh, how do you plan to change the way the company functions? How are you going to raise the millions that this is going to now cost? So five restaurants under construction, each restaurant costing us, you know, on average, you know, give or take about $5 million to open up each restaurant. Self-funded up until this point, so we'll have 13 restaurants. And moving forward, I'm going to look for another way to grow the company. Anyone want to invest? <laughs> Anyone know of any private equity <laughs> companies with unlimited funds? I will probably go to a private equity company, perhaps sell a portion of uh, the restaurant group, and then have access to unlimited funds to, to grow, because I feel like we're just getting warmed up. You're just getting warmed up with another um, facet that's changing, uh, which is fascinating for me, that the restaurant business, uh, one of the elements in the new business, or the new restaurants, is going to be cannabis. Tell us a little bit more about how I can eat a meal that's going to be healthy, which is what your entire empire is based on, with a heck of a lot of cannabis thrown in. Yeah, so we have a new concept that's opening in downtown LA. It's called Gusto Green, and the focus really is about health and wellness. And we truly believe that cannabis is gonna play a part in that, CBD and cannabis. And right now it's not legal to infuse food with uh, THC or CBD. Uh, so the food is infused with adaptogens to help support your health. And when it becomes legal, we will then, you know, infuse the food with THC and CBD, which is really going to be like alcohol is now today. Um, and we do infused uh, dinner parties, private dinner parties now in Toronto, and we will be also catering uh, private dinner parties in LA, infusing. Infusing. Mm -hmm. How does that work? You know, you just take THC, you distill it down, you, you know, you want five milligrams, how do you want to feel? You want to feel a little happy or going to make you feel happy? Is that going to be on the menu then? <laughs> yeah. That's interesting yeah. because it, it's, an, it's, it's a fascinating uh, job of balancing healthy food with what is possibly a, a new way to look at things. It's, it's a balancing act that you do quite well. You are bi-coastal, you live in LA and in Toronto, you run business on both sides. You also somehow manage to balance your work with having a very high profile uh, relationship. How do you do that? Because it cannot be an easy ride for Janet to be dating um, a legend of rock and roll turn up at TIFF, open TIFF with, a, with an amazing documentary about him, and then run back to open five other restaurants. I know. How do you do that? Life is, life is really exciting right now. With a little THC. I love it, yeah. So my boyfriend's Robbie Robertson, I don't know if you know him, the, you know, the lead was the lead of the band, and his documentary film opened TIFF, which I'm very, very proud of him. And you know, he now did the music score for Martin Scorsese's The Irishman, so we go to New York and do that, and my life is very full and his life is very full. And sometimes I think it's better to you know, have a relationship where both lives are kind of going at the same pace. So you, he's mega famous and I'm not though, so. Do you regret using the wedding money for the restaurants then? <laughs> well, here's the question for everyone. We've all eaten at the restaurants. Um, any questions from the audience about the very interesting way that Janet's run her business, built it up? Um, and of course, uh, if anybody wants a table at Felix. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, so nice to meet you. Scotty Greenwood, Canadian American Business Council. And I just want to put this out there for talking later because I'm on the board of directors of a company called Tilray. It's a cannabis company public traded, publicly traded on NASDAQ. And I think we want to invest in you. Oh, seriously. She found an investor. <laughs> this is whole sisterhood. Um, anyone awesome. else either want to have a question or invest with Janet's company and uh, THC? Well, here's a, there's a question right here. Let's wait for the mic. Hey, Paulette. Hi, Janet. Full disclosure, we know each other. So <laughs> I have known Janet when she only had Nervosa, and I, am, I just want to make a comment. I'm so extraordinarily proud of your accomplishment and just the way things are going since... I don't know, 20 years ago? Yeah, yeah, 20 years ago. And in those 20 years, I mean, I think people forget um, when people become celebrities, get on television, judge TV shows and cooking, cooking shows, that there's a whole history um, that, was, that, that was involved in building up that empire. Um, there's another history that you've um, had 
possibly access to view, which would be the Me Too movement in the food industry. Um, you very famously love having a clean home, um, and you threw out Mario Batali's books recently. What was the story there, and how do you turn around and say, okay, in my industry, I can be the change, because I've worked from the ground up to build this up? Yeah, I think it's very different when, um, you know, myself being owning my own company, being a woman, the majority of the leadership in my company are women. Winita Dixon, sitting front and center here, president of um, the restaurant group. Uh, you, you know, it's zero tolerance. You know, it's never gonna happen when you have women at the top. And you're never gonna have, oh, that's just men behaving badly. We don't tolerate it, so it's zero tolerance. And I used to respect Mario Batali, and I collect cookbooks, but keeping his, cookbooks, it's like bad juju. It's like it just brings me down and it's, it's supporting him. So I have to get rid of that because I don't support that kind of behavior. And but did you tolerance. see that happen in the 20 years while you were building up the business before you were Janet Zuccarini? Um, did you see this happen? Did you hear about it? Did you hear about it from other chefs, about, from other, other industry groups in your own chain? Yeah, I would hear about it definitely in you know all the all the restaurants. It's very prevalent in uh, you know the male-dominated industry of the restaurant business, but uh, definitely zero tolerance in in my company. And I've never had any inc incidents of any kind of Me Too movement. And does it make a difference when it's an, it's a female leadership team? Yeah, you know the fish rots from the head down. Whatever's happening at the top is going to happen below, and so you set the tone and. Absolutely zero tolerance. Because it's a heated environment, isn't it? A kitchen uh, is, is heated. You have all the stress between the front of house and, uh, and, and the kitchen in itself. Yeah. How do you balance that if you have a female leader? How is it different from the rest of the industry? It's really hiring great people. Surround yourself with great people. Surround yourself with people that have the same values, concerns, outlooks. And I've never had a minute of this as a, even a conversation in my company because I won't tolerate, I don't hire for that, I hire the right attitude. And this may sound corny, but we run a company based on love. Right, Winita? We, we end a lot of meetings saying, I love you, love you too. Does that work? Yeah, it really does. So I'm just like wondering if, if the front of house is going around saying, I love you, if, if that causes another problem altogether. <laughs> um, no, it's the right kind of love. Well, Respect. It's the, right, it's the right kind of love. Yeah. And people are absolutely key to your, uh, your business, and that's something that you seem to have learned from family. You have, an, you have an interesting family background. Your father was Italian, your mother was German. Um, what would your mother say? Because Janet's one of three sisters, and all three of you are extremely successful. If your mom had to look at you now and describe the three of you as a food item that you've grown up with, what would the three of you be? Right. Like each of you. So my, my sister Jennifer, she's a fashion designer out of New York City. She has a brand called Fleur de Mal. And she's beautiful, she's smart, she's witty. So I think she has many layers to her. So I think my mother would say she's a 100 layer lasagne. <laughs> How's that? Um, my sister Jackie, who, my father brought the first espresso machine into Canada after it was invented. My sister now carries on that business, so espresso coffee machines. And people think she's really soft, but she's really strong on the inside. So I would say, my mother would say she's a tiramisu <laughs> with really strong espresso. And I was a child actress, and my mother would say um, I was a ham but I will say like thin, really thinly sliced prosciutto. A plate of beautifully thin. Prosciutto And I'm thin, beautiful. thinly sliced prosciutto. How's that? I think that's brilliant. I've never <laughs> heard someone describe themselves as prosciutto, but okay. I'm a ham. Only Janet can, so thank you, Janet. Um, there's a special little announcement that I wanted to make because Janet did something very, very sweet for our little community. She has a special treat for all of you, so when you leave today, um, after lunch, uh, Gusto 54 special biscotti is going to be gifted as you depart at an MPW event. So you have something to snack on on your way to work or to the airport or wherever you're going after this. So thank you, Janet, for that. Great being here.